service this morning, we'll be singing 105, Did You Think to Pray? And when you get there, if you'll stand. times come 
that we'll be resting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will be absent from this world. We will be present with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will be, at first, at the judgment seat of Christ, and then at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the wonder of your word, but also, it's in case someone might say, well, then what does this have to do with me? Heavenly Father, God, you have written it, and studying this book, those who study it receive a blessing. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, God, bless us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, just, just beginning here. After these things, well, what things? Well, the opening of the first six seals. And so, they're coming right along, and as they're starting to open those seals, if you remember, no one could open them. No created being on earth, in heaven, or in hell could step forward and open the seals. And when John heard that, what did he do? He wept. I mean, he just broke down and wept. Nobody could open them. But then he said, look, the Lamb. Ah, here steps up the Lamb of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Only he had the authority to step up to the very throne of God and take the book out of the very hand of God and begin to open the seals. And so that we walked through as we opened up those first six seals. And then, John, wait a minute, and again, John's receiving this. And they stop. Instead of just moving to the seventh seal, and we'll pick that up in chapter 8, but it stops and it begins to talk about some other things that must be done. During this time of the opening of the seals, there's some other things that have to take place other than just that open, and this is part of that. And so, and after these things, after the opening of those first six seals, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And so, again... God already has in place these angels. And at this point in time, what do they do? They're holding back some tremendous force. And here it is referred to, and I believe, in fact, it's the wind. You know what kind of damage the wind can do? And we've seen that up here. And, and we see, of course, with cyclones and, and, and tornadoes and all those kinds of things. They're holding back the wind. But in these four corners of the earth, give a little thing you, most of you think it's funny, but the reality was, you know, years ago, and actually there's still a few holdouts, but many, many years ago, uh, the, the scientists believed that the earth was what? Flat. Flat. And of course, the word of God said, no, wait a minute, the word of God says it's a sphere. They were openly persecuted by the scientists at the time telling them what fools they were to believe the word of God. <laughs> because they believed that the earth was flat, and there were those also, theologians, who agreed with them that the earth is flat, and that's the verse they used. They were on the four corners of the world, and a sphere does not have corners. So the world is flat. Just, just thought I'd throw that in for you. But again, so they stand there. They're holding back the wind. They're on the four corners of the earth. And I saw, verse 2, another angel ascending from the east. This actually says, I saw him ascending from the sunrise. Of course, the sunrise is what? In the east. And so, so it's, it's translated east. Having the seal of the living God. Okay, imagine that. Here comes an angel. He has the very seal of the living God. Now, number one, it tells us a couple of things. Number one, God approves and or disapproves things. There is a seal of those things to which he approves. And it also tells us that our God is living. He's alive. And so he comes and says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. You know, it's given these four angels to do harm, to do hurt to the earth, to the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. 
And so it's all set up. This movement, if you will, this force of wind and power. And, and again, you, you just think, just wind itself, tornadoes, cyclones, all the other things of this world that is wind-related, they're about to be cut loose. Right. But they're being held back. Just, just, just hold on. Hold on. God has something that has not yet been finished because it's always done in God's what? Perfect, perfect time. And now is God's perfect time to seal these men. And so it goes on here saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred, forty, four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And again, of course, uh, that is the very place. Uh, that they start quite, well, does it really mean 144,000 or just mean a lot of people? You know, and so they will start, well, you know, that, that really doesn't mean 144,000. It just means a, a bunch, a lot. No, it's very, very clear. And you can go to the Greek, you can go to whatever you want to. It says 144,000. And it doesn't beat around the bush. It doesn't go give us any room to move. It's 144,000 unless you simply want to refuse to believe what the Word of God says. Right. And it amazes me how many people simply refuse to believe what the Word of God says. So here's the number. I uh, heard the number, which is given, sealed. There were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of what? Israel. Israel. Yeah. Okay? You, you have got to play fast and loose with the Word of God to change that. Right. Amen. You have to pay fast and loose with the word of God to turn that into the church. Because this is not talking about the church. Amen. The church this is talking about Israel. Remember the last place we heard about the church was chapter three. three. Okay? Beginning chapter four, no more church. All the way through to almost the very end of the revelation before the church is even mentioned again. The point, because the church has been removed in the rapture. That's right. And now, the, now this starts. Now the tribulation begins. This has nothing any longer to do with the church until the end of the revelation. That's right. This is Israel. And so as we pick up, as we see this, and, and if it wasn't enough, listen, there's going to be 144,000. Then it goes on and says, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of Reuben, 12,000. Of Gad, 12,000. Of Asher, 12,000. Of Naphtali, sealed 12,000. Of Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Issachar, 12,000. Zebulun, 12,000. Joseph, 12,000. Benjamin, 12,000. And by the way, that adds up to 144,000. But again, so if it isn't enough, though, the statement, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel, now we, now we are clear as to exactly what tribes we're going to pull 12,000 from each of those tribes. And by the way, there's, there's been a little change up here. And uh, there's a tri and it, when you look at the 12 tribes of Israel in different places in the Word of God, it's not always the same 12. And there's a tribe missing here. Dan. Dan. Yeah, the tribe of Dan is, is, is missing. And, and again, so it, and it has been replaced. Uh, again, Joseph, it was told, <coughs> was going to receive a double portion. He does that here. And so as we walk through, as we see these things, as we, we read, and how specific, very, very specific that this is. But these angels, they stopped from unleashing that, that they are prepared, if you will, to set loose. They're stopped. And we hear the number. We see the people. It's the 12 tribes of Israel. Each is noted. And then, of course, as we just said, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. And there's lots of suggestions as to why that might be. They were the first to fall into idolatry. Uh, they continue to what? Just not repent, 
not walk with God, and it appears that it almost as though God said, okay, he just walked them right out of Israel. Uh, if they were going to continue, again, in that direction. And so the scripture continues to walk down through and tell us about this 144,000. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. And so first he lays out for us that there's going to be 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. He makes that exceedingly clear. They are going to be sealed, if you will, and they're going to receive the name of God. We find that out a little bit later, but the literal name of God in their foreheads. And they are protected until they finish what God has sent them to do. Amen. Okay, before Revelation's over, they too are going to be martyred. But at this point in time, they're absolutely under the protecting hand of God. Nothing can touch them. And so, again, it's made very, very clear. This seems to, to, to go along the idea here that this 144,000 protected by God going forth to do what? Preach. To preach. So they're going forward to preach the word of God. And so as they are sent out, because this is very important to the next portion that we're reading. First, they're sealed. They're sent out. They go all throughout the entire world. It's interesting, and again, I'll just, just mention this quickly. Uh, a lot of commentators you may read or in, you know, may have a, a Bible with, with a commentary in it. And they'll say, sent out from Israel. Doesn't say that. Okay? And, and it's my opinion. I don't know that there's a nation on earth that doesn't have a Jewish population. They're already all over the world. It's my opinion God's just going to seal these whom he has chosen there. They're already there. They already know the language. They already know the culture. They already know. They're throughout the entire world already. God's just going to seal them where they are and send them out preaching the gospel. My opinion. And it's again, walking through, looking at this. Now, they have been sealed. They have been, if you will, set apart, sanctified by God to do a specific work during the tribulation. Now, verse 9, after this, what? After they've been sealed, after they've been ready, after this I beheld the Lord, a great multitude, which no man could number, of what? All the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. The church is already gone. This isn't the church, okay? This is tribulation time. And so this is a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues, stood before, where are they? The throne. And before the Lamb, before Christ, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Boy, listen, this, these are those who are saved by the testimonies of 144,000 sent out around the world and almost immediately upon their reception of Jesus Christ as their Savior, what happens? Martyr. They're martyred. They're killed. And, and we will see later on as we look it up how they lose their lives. After this, he says, I beheld this great multitude from every place on earth. And I cried with a loud voice. And or they, excuse me, and cried, they cried, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Boy, these who have been what saved and brought, martyred and brought now into heaven itself. They cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Where did their salvation come from is the idea. Praise God. Because what? Because they're in heaven. They're standing before the throne of God. They have just been rescued from death and destruction, the most horrible time that has ever taken place on earth, as they were there, not only witnesses, but partakers of what was going on during the tribulation. And they, through 
all warnings, no doubt. Wait, listen, don't receive Christ as you're saved. Do you know what they're going to do to you? Have you not seen what's going on? Look, no, I believe no. in Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, if, if the next day of my life means the last day of my life, I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Their conviction, the leading and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God upon their lives, they simply could not refuse the truth of Jesus Christ and salvation that is in Jesus Christ. And so these who now have become martyrs, this great throng of people are now standing before the very throne of God, clothed in white robes, palms in their hands. And so what about the palms in their hands? Well, of course, that takes us back to what? Jesus Christ's triumphal entry. And the triumphal entry, what was happening? People were praising and glorifying what? The king as he is coming into Jerusalem. And they're laying down the palms and they're doing all of those things. Listen, these people in the same manner cried out receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And I believe that this is simply a, a, a sign, if you will, in heaven that this is what they've done. And so they have the palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne. How many of the angels? All. All the angels. This is an amazing statement. Mm -hmm. All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders. They're standing around the throne and around the elders. Speaking of the angels. And the four beasts. They're also there before the throne. And fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Interesting thing is, I've always pictured this as the angels, as the elders, as the beasts all fall on their faces. Actually, the way this is stated, the angels surround them all and they fall on their faces. And so we have the angels prostrating before God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. This sevenfold praise to God, given to him, what? By the angels. And I think one of the most significant things about that fact, that this is the angels there, because the angels have been with God since their very creation. They have been there from the time that the devil was Lucifer, took a third of the angels, tried to come against God, and was thrown out of heaven. They were there. They saw it. They are true witnesses. They have been witnesses over all the millennium right. to watch God and his love, not his hatred, not, not, not his, his discipline, but his love for mankind right. and his reaching out. And his Listen, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. The very love of God reaching out to mankind. The angels have witnessed. Amen. And they have seen these things unfold before their eyes. And now they look at God in this great throng. Listen, during the tribulation time, once the church was, was raptured, and they go into the tribulation time, everybody that goes in are rejectors of God. Every single one of them. Why should God care for them at all? yet he still loves them. And he seals 144,000 to go throughout the entire world preaching the gospel and drawing them to Jesus Christ. The angels have witnessed. The angels have seen God in his glory. And the angels say, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. Listen, these who have observed him for millennia, they fall down Amen. and they praise God. No one but them has had the, the scope of that which God has done for mankind. And, and they give him all the glory. And it's interesting, and, and I'll, I'll go down through this quickly because we're already almost out of time. But let me go down through this quickly. 
And again, the seven ways that they ascribe praise unto God, the thing that you have to see, each and every one of these words, Greek words, can be used in general. But this is specific to God. The way that, that this is written, and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God. And then he moves through it, and all the angels stood round about the throne, and the elders saying, it's the angels who fell down. It's the angels who are speaking. The amen, blessing, glory, wisdom. And ultimately, unto our God forever and ever. Amen. This praise and glory and honor is only to God. And it will continue forever and ever. Quickly. Eulogia is, is that first word, this blessing. This eulogia. And we get our, our word eulogy from it. It is, is when we come to a funeral. And we read about that person and his life. Eulogy literally means, or eulogio, actually means to speak well of. Mm -hmm. And so this eulogia, and, and so they are coming and they're what? Man, they're speaking well of him, which nothing but good could be said. But the idea here of eulogia is an overflow of blessing and praise. This blessing. This eulogia is overflowing, is forever and ever, and will never cease as it flows to the very God of heaven. Second thing, glory. And again, normal word that is used for glory throughout the word of God, doxa. But here it's a clear, present reference to eternal God. Doxa, praise belonging here to God alone. They are giving him praise that can't be given anywhere else. They're giving glory that cannot be given to anyone else. Thirdly, wisdom. Oh, it's again Greek word Sophia. And this is knowledge and intelligence possessed only by God. Knowledge and intelligence is the idea of Sophia. And as they give him this wisdom, well, you, you have the knowledge, you have the intelligence. It's possessed only by you. No one else, nothing else could possess this wisdom. And so the angels are just pouring out the reality of who God is. Fourthly, Eucharistia. And again, we get our English word about Eucharist from this. And of course, that is used mainly by the Catholics concerning coming to communion, what we call communion. But again, Eucharistia, the giving of thanks to what? To God alone. This is thanksgiving, the fourth thing they talk about. And this is thanksgiving that can only be given to God because it was, could only be accomplished by God. Amen. Our salvation could have been accomplished by nothing else, Amen. only through God. And God's love that brought him to what? Give his son. This thanksgiving is far and above any other kind of thanksgiving that man could ever imagine. And so this thanksgiving goes on to honor. And time is the Greek word that is used here. And the matter of honor is our esteem and honor of God who is worthy. Mm -hmm. Only he is worthy of this honor and this esteem. The idea of esteem and honor, and especially in reference to God, is just, oh, okay, we honor men, we have an Olympics. Put them up on the podium, give them their medals. We, we honor them for their accomplishments, okay? This is God. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? Can't reach high enough. This is God. He is esteemed. He is placed on that pedestal above everything else in the world, in heaven itself. It is God who is great. And so there's this wonder, this beauty of, of steaming our esteem and our honor of God who is worthy of what? That honor and that esteem. Nobody else is. Only God. And then it goes on to that, uh, from that. It says honor and power. Dunamis, and we've looked at this word many times. Uh, there's this idea of dunamis is this power, this wondrous power. And here the idea of God possessing this dunamis it, it is miraculous power and ability forwarded only to God. Right. No man can have the power that God has had. What man, what angel, what demon 
has ever simply spoken it so. God set the earth in place, set the heavens in place, created what? He spoke it was so. There's nothing else that has that power, that has this dunamis, miraculous power and ability that only God possesses. That's what these angels are praising. That's why they're on their face before God. And then lastly, of course, as we look at this, it's might. Now, this idea here uh, of, of power and might, listen, they're hooked at the hip, okay? But the reality of dunamis, this miraculous power and ability, uh, is kous, is, is the Greek word uh, here, again, for might, and it means force, strength, and might. Force, strength, and might. So he has the miraculous power and ability, and Akus is the reality that he also has forth strength and might to bring it forward and make it happen. For one to have an ability to, to accomplish something doesn't mean they'll accomplish it. They also have to have the other things that go along with it to make that happen. It's just like you have know, lots and lots of people have lots and lots of great ideas. But they either don't have the backing or they don't have the money to make it happen. See, they, they don't have the force. They don't have the strength to make it happen. God always has the force. He yeah. always has the strength. He always has the might to make anything that he says happen. And so he has the dunamis, the miraculous power and ability, but he also has the iskus, which is the force and the strength and the might to make it happen. That's where we're going to hold up. We'll pick up from there next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the wonder of your word, for the wonder of your might. Amen. God, thank you for all you have done for us. Thank you for the angels. Two-thirds of the original angels who are still with you. And they have watched, and they have seen, and they believe, and they praise, Heavenly Father, God, for only you are God. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. We pray that truly this has been an encouragement. I know it just encouraged me this week as I studied it, as I looked it over, as again my mind was once again challenged to the reality of who you are and what you have accomplished, are accomplishing, and Heavenly Father, God, what you're going to accomplish. Thank you for giving us the future. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name.